third lecture in the forum series of this academic year and invite you to stay for the social hour and the reception following the lecture this evening. It's my privilege and great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening and welcome her back to her native state of Indiana. Dr. Anna Heyer is already known to many of you, I'm sure, since she has held leadership positions in the National Education Association since 1951. From 1957 to 1959, Dr. Heyer was Executive Secretary of the Department of Audiovisual Instruction of the NEA and concurrently held the position of Director of the Division of Educational Technology, a position she holds today. You probably have read some of the editorials of Dr. Heyer uh, in audiovisual instruction while she was editor of that magazine from 1957 to 1970. And quite likely, you have read some articles in Audiovisual Communication Review, of which she was managing editor from 1954 to 1958. You might also know that Dr. Heyer held faculty positions at Syracuse and Indiana Universities. But did you know that Dr. Heyer started her distinguished educational career right here in Muncie, Indiana, as a science teacher and guidance counselor as she graduated with scholastic distinction from Purdue University with a degree in science. Later, she earned her master's degree from Northwestern University and her doctor's degree from Indiana University. So we who make our home in Indiana can look with great pride on our fellow Hoosier. Dr. Heyer has had a number of international assignments. Earlier in her career, she directed three motion picture crews in Iran and Turkey under a USIA grant to Syracuse University. And since 1958, she has been U.S. representative to the International Council for Educational Media. And since 1962, Dr. Heyer has been secretary of the Audiovisual Committee of the World Confederation of Organizations of the Teaching Profession, and she has organized annual programs in countries throughout the world. And I understand that next month, uh, Dr. Heyer will be going to Europe for some meetings on instructional technology. It's our great pleasure, Dr. Heyer, to have you back in Muncie, Indiana tonight to speak to us on the topic of instructional technology. Dr. Heyer. Thank you. I don't know. Thank you very much. I don't know whether he shut those doors, whether he was locking you in or not. I think he was. But uh, good evening. It is good to uh, be back in Indiana again. After all the things he told you, you can understand why I look as old as I do. <laughs> I am. <laughs> I'm uh, very glad to be here. I'm uh, happy, too, for uh, a very unusual reason that they ran the notice, evidently, in the star that I was going to be here because I received a letter from uh, a friend that I hadn't uh, made contact with since I was in high school, and I've had a telephone call. And just a little while ago, a, uh, a gentleman that I went to school with, uh, evidently back in Eaton uh, High School, uh, returned ten dollars that he said he'd borrowed from me in 1939. <laughs> so it's been a profitable evening. <laughs> That's usually more than I get paid for talking. They. Um, I sometimes uh, can uh, give a rather light and uh, airy presentation, but this evening I have rather a weighty topic, so uh, I hope that uh, most of you didn't have as good a dinner as I had, or you may not stay awake throughout the entire thing, but we hope you will. I've been told that all the librarians that are here are going to get A's in all their courses uh, for attending the lecture tonight. That was what I was told, wasn't it? <laughs> 
Well, sir, uh, there are some uh, librarians I take it here, and I understand there are some people from a uh, teacher education course too that may be in the audience. So, even though I'm directing a good number of my illustrations to the librarians, why well, perhaps they can get some things from it also. I, uh, in a very general sense, this paper might be called Middletown Revisited. Major changes have taken place since the days of Middletown in our lives and in our society and in the realities with which all of us must deal. It was here in Muncie, Indiana in 1925 that Robert and Helen Lynn completed the fieldwork for their pioneer study in the manner of social anthropology, using Muncie as a typical case example. And when the Lynns returned to Muncie ten years later, in the mid-30s, after the community had experienced an unprecedented boom and then a bust, they noted an impression of external improvement in sprucing up at a number of points. Schools had been refurbished and a boulevard ran beside the river and a park and a swimming pool had replaced the dump in the center of town. They thought at first that these were the fruits of the boom years, but it turned out that they were WPA projects undertaken after the bust in 1929. Now why hadn't, the Lynns wondered, why hadn't this been done earlier in the boom period? The Lynns knew that these were things that people had talked about and editors had written about as old familiar problems ten years earlier. So the investigators suggested that there were some reasons why this work had remained undone. First, the Lynns said there was a tradition of approaching stated problems negatively rather than positively which made economy the watchword of the local government. And second, they said this tradition emphasized the known and avoided the unknown, and Middletowners distrusted planners, intellectuals, and all men who let their thoughts and imagination run beyond immediacies. Big steps in a world devoted to gradualness are suspect, the Lynn said. And third, they said that Middletowners showed a perversive pride in how far we've come which made the present look good as compared with the past. Thus, an epidemic of only 75 cases of scarlet fever looked good as compared with 300 in the old days. And in the absence of prospective standards, this fallacy of movement lulled local critics and stifled action. So the Lynns concluded that in a culture so patterned, the likelihood of the emergence of forthright civil social change is curtailed almost to the vanishing point. What did bring change about in the 30s in terms of civic improvements? It was the agency of the federal government. Suddenly the New Deal, with the New Deal, the city began to move in a non-Euclidean world in which the old civic axioms were suspended, and the city was asked to state its civic desires positively, to frame a new series of objectives, to go ahead and to act on them. And having no alternative at the time, the city began to play the game. Now these introductory remarks are drawn largely from a brilliant latter-day review of the two old Lynn books by Donald Canty, which appeared in the January 29, 1972 issue of the New Republic. It seems to me that there's a lesson for us here today when I'm revisiting Middletown, a lesson that is related to our present educational dilemma. Because do we really understand the role of and the need for outside planning and leadership to release and facilitate local change? And are we still approaching our problems negatively rather than positively? And are we willing in our sphere of education to state our goals clearly in terms of measurable objectives? Are we hung up on a tradition in our schools and libraries? Are we satisfied with averages rather than a concern for each person as an individual? And are we in education still looking back at how far we've come? I'm tempted at this point to consider just how far we have come in education since I taught in junior high school science here in Muncie about 30 years ago, but I'll forgo that pleasure. Now my assignment here today indicated that I could speak on any aspect of the general topic of instructional systems technology. Now I've taken some liberty with this. I've uh, chosen to enlarge the scope of my remarks from the area of instructional technology to the much broader area of educational technology. And I've done this because it will give me more latitude 
and it will make possible a more logical and closer relationship between our topic today and the major social, political, and economic problems facing our nation. Because understanding this relationship between our library, media, technology concerns, and our national problems is without any question the only way we're going to introduce into our educational institutions the magnitude of change that will make any difference at all. Now, another reason for enlarging the scope of my remarks is that libraries are concerned not only with instruction, but with education in the broader sense. And also, it seems to me that educational technology is further developed than is instructional technology, which, to my way of thinking, scarcely exists at all at the present time. I've also eliminated the word systems for the reason that my definition of educational technology, and for that matter, any definition of technology, includes the concept of systems. I'll elaborate on this a little later. And so I've chosen to call my paper, Educational Technology, a Challenge for Librarians. Now, the word technology is derived from the Greek word te technologia, which means systematic treatment. That is, the process of analyzing a human task and devising a system of materials, personnel, and procedures to accomplish it. Now, when the word technology is modified by such terms as instruction and education, and when all of this is related to the idea of a library, we have established some almost global parameters for our discussion. Looking back over the years in our efforts to relate libraries and media, I've concluded that we were too often limited by a micro rather than a macro view of education and our relation to this larger view. You might say that we were middle towners during the boom years. Now, Hoban, in 1962, 10 years ago, was one of the first to clearly differentiate between media and technology. He said, technology is not just machines and men. It is a complex, integrated organization of men and machines, of ideas, of procedures, and of management. Now, the U.S. Commission on Instructional Technology in its 1970 report further defined instructional technology as a systematic way of designing, carrying out, and evaluating the total process of learning and teaching in terms of specific objectives based on research in human learning and communication and employing a combination of human and non-human resources to bring about more effective instruction. Now, media, on the other hand, is much simpler. It's a subset, you might say, of educational technology. And it refers to those materials and devices which mediate between the user and the real event. Media lack the systematic integration that is the hallmark of technology. Media are simply tools, not a system. Now, in military and industrial circles, technological systems may be fully developed and pre-tested and revised before they're adopted, like a new weapons system. But this is not the practice in educational circles, at least not at the present time. A technological systems in education develop on a piecemeal basis and usually without central direction or control. Usually, the impact of technology is felt first in terms of the devices we use, that is, the hardware and the software, then in terms of people and man-machine relationships. And the next impact tends to be on the processes, that is, the support systems and procedures that are associated with the man-machine relationships. And lastly, largely as a result of the devices and processes, the related goals and values of the total effort tend to change. As a technology develops within a society, it produces confusion over means and ends, processes and purposes, goals and values change, and old laws become burdensome or useless and must be changed, and change, of course, is difficult. 
Now, new goals become visible as well as possible with technology, and new dimensions of human dignity come within our grasp. I guess what I'm saying is that the proper study of technology is the study of man, man as an individual and man as a society. At any given time, one phase of technological development may be fairly well advanced while another is very crude. For example, uh, libraries are much more advanced in the incorporation of new media into their collections than they were in devising procedures to make the new library concept function adequately. This is to say that there's a lag between the development of new procedures for classification, cataloging, shelving, circulation, and the more fundamental need of making necessary changes in the purpose of the library. A couple of examples of the development of a technology may be useful to explain what I'm trying to say. Let's take the invention of the automobile, which is a device, which gradually came to look less and less like the buggy, which it was later to replace. Now, the automobile was followed by changes in human behavior, in what people do and where and how they do it. The auto gave rise to suburbia, the commuter, new jobs, and even to international tensions. And gradually, new processes and techniques were invented, the nationwide road system, the supporting gasoline and garage system. And now we have pollution control efforts, streets for people only, and special highway lanes reserved for buses, all process changes. The logic of the two and three car family is now beginning to be questioned. To put it another way, the original goals of transportation related to the first cars are now being questioned. In a similar developmental vein, clay tablets and scrolls and then books developed before the mass of the people were influenced by them and before orderly systems for processing their collection had been invented, such as the Dewey Decimal System, before we had library shelving and card catalogs, before schools of library education were established, and before the goal was established of having a library in every school and in every community. But now that all these interrelated things exist, one can say that a technology of librarianship exists at least for the printed collections. And of course, the Dewey Decimal System is as much a part of the technology as is the web press and the librarian. Maybe you never thought of yourself as a part of the technology, but you are. We have perhaps again reached the point where some of our original goals are being challenged. I hear there's some serious questions, for example, being raised in some quarters about a duplication of effort between school and public libraries. So let's look for a moment at how this developmental sequence of technology has affected teachers and media specialists. As more and more of the new things of instruction became available in the schools, uh, we accepted the fact that a function of media was to supplement the teacher through enhancing his effectiveness in the classroom. Educational media are both tools for teaching and avenues for learning. And their function is to serve these two processes by enhancing clarity in communication, diversity in method, and forcefulness in appeal. An illustration of this function would be the librarian's use of a film or film strip to teach the use of the card catalog. Note that the media in this illustration are used for presentational purposes and used by the librarian as an additional tool, an extension of a human. In other words, it is a case of an objective being reached by a teacher with media. The teacher is there with the media. It's an additional tool, an extension. Now, another example of this things level of technological development would be the combining of the book library with the audiovisual center that is, placing them within the same physical area of the school and renaming the new entity the Media Center, or God forbid, the Educational Technology Center. 
Now, eventually, the use of hardware and software tools begins to change human behavior and the relationship of people to things. For example, the librarian may decide to put the visit to the library or the demonstration on how to use the card catalog on videotape so that it can be used time and time again by a closed circuit television on student demand. Now the librarian is determining the objective, selecting the method and content, and evaluating the final learning outcome, but we have a difference. Media have substituted for a previous activity of the librarian. In other words, he is a teacher on media, or to use Heineck's term, a mediated teacher. Now here we have not the teacher with the media, but the teacher or the media. The teacher makes the choice, but the media may do it without the presence of the teacher. Now this function of media may be said to enhance overall productivity. When you, when you have the teacher and media, you have an additive factor, don't you, in cost. But if you have the teacher or the media, you may have a trade-off, a question of productivity through the instructional media, where the teacher can do another function at the time the media is performing that uh, chore. Now, this function of media may be said, then, to enhance overall productivity through instructional media and systems which do not depend upon the teacher for routine execution of many of the instructional processes or for clerical and mechanical chores. Now, if we apply this developmental level concept to our earlier media center illustration, we would find that the library and the AV center had moved from sharing joint facilities to an integrated collection and a service program, an integrated service program based on a systematic achievement of specified objectives. This is different than just housing them in the same place. We now have an integration of both the collection and the service programs. It is self-evident that this level of development requires retraining of staff for new roles and the introduction of new jobs, such as the library technician, the audiovisual technician, the production specialist, and the like. As we get more comfortable with the concept of mediated instruction, we begin to explore new uses of media beyond that of presentation. And we find that media can take over many functions, such as storage and retrieval of information, self-analysis, like with uh, using the videotape, or distribution of information and data, such as with television, or interaction, like with uh, uh, CAI or self-instruction, like in programmed instruction. So there are many functions that it can perform. Now, changes in the role of people and media bring pressures for change in processes and procedures. An example is the rise of the media support system for the teacher, which provides for projection of service, materials and equipment delivery, equipment repair, production of materials, and changes in the cataloging rules and procedures. As soon as we make the decision that the library will not only acquire and store media of all types, but that it will fully integrate the book and non-book materials, we've opened up a tremendous number of questions and problems in the process and procedures area. And this is the stage, I think, a stage of technology where most of the libraries and media centers are operating today. Now, some examples of the process problems with which we are struggling today are the lack of multimedia library procedures, poor documentation of the newer media, difficulties of handling and maintaining media of different physical formats, the cost of materials and equipment, the lack of standardization of terminology, copyright, circulation and use problems, lack of space for storage and handling the new media, lack of workable cataloging rules, question of how to provide for remote electronic browsing, and the growing problem of professional preparation. These are just some of the questions, I think, facing us in the process procedures management area. 
Now as we begin to change the functioning of the library, we begin to affect the goals and values. For all practical purposes, librarians have been saying in the past, a la Henry Ford, we will provide any information that you want as long as you come to us to get it, as long as you can read, as long as someone else hasn't got it. Isn't that about the way the library operates? Libraries and media centers are being forced to do more than that, to meet the needs of individuals and to accommodate their learning styles and to provide equal access for all groups, including minorities, the poor, and those in remote areas. The emergence in its own right of non-book media is having an effect on the curriculum. I have a uh, colleague in England who has uh, observed this, and I will quote him. The book has profoundly influenced education ever since printing was invented, and those subjects which are most easily propagated by books have tended to prosper. The new media service other subjects which have a high experience quality, such as drama, music, art, and craft, bringing the best experience to everyone with a kind of immediacy which some people gain from a book. This may very well produce a new evaluation of the several disciplines within the curriculum and an alteration of the balance between them. Something of this has already occurred in adult life. He goes on to say, not only do those subjects that can be taught best by the book method prosper, but the goals of instruction have been influenced by and have depended upon the book as the primary medium of education. However, as new teaching materials become available, educational goals and methodology change. An example is foreign language teaching. When the book was the sole teaching material, the objectives were to read and write the language. With the introduction of discs and tapes and language laboratories, a major emphasis was placed for the first time on speaking the language. This quote reminds me of my early life here in rural Indiana when the spelling bee had already passed its prime as a social and intellectual event of some importance. Fortunately, the spelling bee and other rigid rote forms of book learning have outlived their crude attempts to reflect simplistic goals of education. The idea that an education is simply a matter of learning what is to be found in books was dealt with by Edgar Lee Masters in his Spoon River Anthology, where Frank Drummer speaks from his grave, My tongue could not speak what stirred within me, and the village thought me a fool. Yet at the start there was a clear vision, a high and urgent purpose in my soul, which drove me on trying to memorize the Encyclopedia Britannica. As uh, was previously stated, a, a technological system tends to evolve on a piecemeal basis rather than to spring full-blown from the nervous head. Changes can occur in devices and people and processes independently, that is, without being systematically integrated. And this is the present state of technology, or you might say pre-technology, in education and in librarianship. This state has been referred to by Snyder as level one technology, which he says is characterized by the audiovisual aid or product definition of educational technology, whereby the major end is to provide materials and services to classroom teachers on demand. At this level, the curriculum and the teaching functions are enriched and supplemented by an array of media and machines which are clearly under the control of the teacher. Here, success most frequently is measured numerically in terms of student and teacher use of the resources. We often see reports that say the number of films circulated in a year and, and so on. It's a numerical one referring to a product level of technology. A new developments such as computer-assisted instruction and cable television are used at level one provided they do not significantly interrupt established class organization, scheduling, and gradedness. In action, level one is characterized by order and neatness. The problems we are facing are tremendous even at this level one or product <coughs> definition of, of technology. 
At this level, I would define the role of the library, if we're thinking of level one, the role of the library I would define as to collect, store, organize, and dispense recorded information and ideas. If one were to broaden the role of the library to include all the functions formally provided by the library and the audiovisual center, then the problem is either fur even further complicated. This is probably why some individuals, such as S.G. Prentice, are advocating only the first step, that is, incorporating the recorded materials in the library, into the library, but not attempting to embrace the other media functions. Let me clarify this by quoting from his uh, paper, or an abstract of it, entitled Libraries in a Changing Society. And uh, Prentice says, the production gives this illustration. The production and broadcast of a television program, for example, is a communication function, but it is not a library function. Should the same television program be recorded and stored, however, it will have immediately gained a new dimension because in its recorded form it can be reused at will. The library function is performed, he says, when an aggregation of such materials is stored in a systematic way. Now that's not an old definition, that's a 1972 one by a librarian. And I would say he is operating at the level one, the product definition of a library. Uh, gradually, the pieces, the products, uh, the, uh, and the people and the processes, they begin to be seen and treated as an interrelated whole. And Snyder calls this more advanced level of technology level two. And he describes level two uh, as being characterized by a systematic or process approach to educational technology. And it is usually based on clearly stated learning objectives. And its major end is to maximize individual attainment for learners. At this level, resources are considered to be a viable mix of men, media, and machines that can hopefully be adjusted to individual learning. You see here, this becomes more of a system where we have a choice. At times, we decide whether the teacher alone, the teacher with media, or the media alone can perform a particular objective and uh, do this in a systematic way to meet our objectives. And here, success is measured not numerically, but in terms of the learning output, usually assessed on an individual basis. Newer developments, such as computer-assisted instruction, are often the basis for abolishing, sometimes on an experimental basis, to be true, to abolish class organization, group scheduling, and gradedness. The level two approach tends to force a consideration of basic questions about curriculum, staff functions, and instructional objectives. And in action, level two doesn't look very neat don't have the students all divided up doing the same thing at the same time. Now the level two technology, in the level two technology, the pieces that are dealt with independently at level one are interrelated in a systematic way using what we call standard problem solving techniques. Now one way to describe a problem solving technique is by talking about steps, systems approach steps such as those that are on the screen identifying the needs, setting up measurable objectives, considering the constraints and alternative solutions, selecting from among the alternatives, implementing the chosen alternative, and evaluating the results against the objectives that we have set up, then modifying the system depending on the feedback that we get to correct its deficiencies and then recycling. Only the beginnings of level two technology can be seen in the school's scientifically developed combination of instructors, materials, and technological media for obtaining optimum learning with a minimum of routine personal involvement by the teacher. And the result is a carefully planned system consisting of subject matter, procedures, and media coordinated in a program unit design which is directed towards specific behavioral objectives. 
Now the support role of the teacher and the librarian are quite different in a level two technology than they are at a level one. Now librarians too are experimenting with technology at level two, for example in attempts to apply information science and experiments with networking systems. The networking systems are focusing on more efficient and economical ways in the rapidly expanding volume of recorded knowledge and on the other hand with the problem of decentralizing library services by taking the information to the user and thereby increasing the access to the library resources. Louis uh, Vaganos who was writing in I think it was the January 72, yes January 72 library journal seems to be directing his criticism to level two technology when he states, and I quote him, that information scientists have not understood the nature of their problem and lack the meaningful direction of realistic goals. Now technology that is process oriented requires of us new patterns of thinking and operating. I think this is what he was saying. It requires new staff training for new roles and a different phrasing of research questions, and above all, definitive goal setting, which we have uh, usually refused to do. In other words, it must be based on system-wide changes that extend far beyond the library. To illustrate, let me quote again S.G. Prentiss. He says that an area where research would be productive is, and I quote him, the adaptation of modern electronic and photographic technology to library purposes, especially in such areas as the use of libraries which are physically removed from the user. But what are the library purposes? To me, this quote from Prentice illustrates a research question that would be more appropriate for level one technology than for level two. Level two would not be concerned with adapting the technology to the library, but rather in adapting the library through technological means so as to increase its usefulness. Now this difference in focus, in my opinion, is quite important for us to grasp. And it's a question that we are ducking in all of society, I think. And it goes back to the means ends confusion that is typically associated with technology. Now, as I have attempted to point out in library and educational circles, we are currently operating at a product level one technology. We are, however, moving toward the level two technology. And both levels will continue to exist for many years, hopefully with increasing signs of compatibility. And the move from level one to level two generates a great deal of stress or what some writers are now recalling, recalling future shock. It does not seem possible to avoid the malady of future shock. The best one can do is to prepare for it and thereby reduce shock through understanding. In other words, we must have a clear picture in our minds of where we are and where we want to go. Now, what are some of the areas that require understanding and treatment if future shock among librarians is to be avoided? Well, here are some that occur to me. The information overload. This, uh, we've got to, I think, understand something about this. This condition is due partly to the information explosion and partly to our inability to distinguish between useful and non-useful information. We store both of them equally well. A note, I think that the uh, Dr. Miller used to head the library down at Indiana University, said he sometimes thought that it would be a good idea if all libraries, libraries burned down every 20 years. Uh, I think he was being a little facetious, but the idea of the, the useless and the useful both being there taking up equal space so this is one of our problems. Note that I say the information explosion rather than the knowledge explosion. As far as I'm concerned, there is no knowledge explosion. There may be a need, however, for some kind of a new contraceptive that will limit the output of the printing presses and the tape recorders. When uh, 
Thurber Hall was dedicated at Ohio State University some years ago. The OSU photo department wrote James Thurber to inquire if they could make a sound motion picture of the event, including his speech. And Thurber wrote back, no, you may not take a motion picture of me reading my remarks on your campus. You already have a copy of my speech. Your library has all of my books. There is nothing more. We are suffering from overcommunication," he said. Now the second thing I think we need to understand if we're to avoid the future shock for librarians are the changes in the formats in which information is stored. We're only beginning to feel the effects of multimedia formats for storage and dissemination of information. To date, libraries have been able to sidestep the issue because most information available in so-called non-book formats was also available in the printed form, but this will not continue to be true. All right, a third thing that we believe we need to understand is the value-free stance with which we have, uh, uh, have in the past uh, the position that we have been able to take. We have uh, been able to sidestep this by uh, more or less, um, well, just just ducking it, I guess sometimes it was forced upon us. Uh, we've, uh, by default, have accepted a value like in relationship to the black or the poor or minorities. But we really, uh, uh, really most of the time, we were like the scientists we just didn't take a value judgment of our, uh, the acts or the things that we were inventing or on the directions in which things were moving us. Right, the next is man-machine relationships that can no longer be viewed, uh, I think, men and machines as protagonists. They've got to operate within a system playing uh, related but distinctive roles toward the achievement of objectives. And this, I think, we must understand. And then we have the problem of cost-effectiveness that we're hearing more about because technology has embedded in it the concepts of trade-offs on reallocation of resources. We evaluate, and then if things aren't going well, we, re, we uh, reallocate them. And society now is taking a highly pragmatic attitude toward institutions. It is toward education right now, turning down many bond issues and the like. And I would suggest that if adequate library services cannot efficiently be delivered to potential users, these services and or the libraries will be sloughed off as institutions that have outlived their time. You know, there's a growing literature on alternatives for both schools and libraries. And the next day, uh, the school organization, I think we need to do some thinking about possible changes and plan for changes in educational organization. The library of the future will need to serve, I think, not only individuals engaged in formal education in schools, but also those that are being educated through many alternatives to formal schooling and those that are engaged in continuing education. And then we will need, I think, to prepare ourselves in the area of the individualization of instruction or the individualization, perhaps, of programs of instruction would be a better way of putting it because although this is related to self-instruction and independent study, it shouldn't be confused with it because you can individualize instruction and deal with groups of children or you can have, you can have it self-instruction and give all of them the same thing to do, which isn't individualizing it at all. But uh, it means the serving of the needs of each individual as opposed to catering only to the mean of the group. And it provides for humanization of education through options about what is learned and when and where and how it's learned. And I guess we have perhaps the one I would thought that I had added on there, which shows goals doesn't seem to be there, but I think we need to be concerned with uh, goals. Uh, both, uh, uh, it's almost getting increasingly impossible, this is closely related to values, for institutions or for professions even to operate without taking value stands. 
And I've seen that in the uh, National Education Association not too many years back. They did not take stands on such things as who was nominated to the Supreme Court or whether 18-year-olds voted, these kinds of things. But you notice that they are taking a, a stand on these things. They have a goal in mind. So I think that uh, goals are going to become increasingly important for us to specify. Now, it's been said that um, librarians and teachers are conservative by nature, that they resist change. But I doubt that they are more resistant to change than other members of society, because as I observe, most people in the world are willing to accept a revolutionary process of development for others, but only an evolutionary process for themselves. And there are some steps, I think, that can be taken to facilitate the role change among librarians, and I think these would apply also to teachers. We can provide future librarians with a working knowledge of technology, including man-machine relationships, the scientific method of problem solving, and particularly technology as applied to librarianship and to education. I think these are changes I think we ought to be thinking of in our content for our training programs. Uh, second, we can acquaint future librarians with the wide range of media formats and with instructional systems composed of one or more media. And the characteristics, valuation, selection, processing, handling, and using. And very important, we can instill in the future librarian attitudes that will support new roles rather than being apprehensive of them. And we can instill a value-oriented stance. We can train a librarian who will be skilled in team operation within an institutional setting because I think the trend in education and including library work is going to be more team oriented than individual. And we can prepare a librarian for the future who will have at his command techniques useful in the individualization of instruction. And we can prepare more specialists and fewer generalists in the future because I think that the future seems to lie with specialization. I think this is true both for the teacher and for the librarian. I think that there will be a differentiation in roles that this will proceed from the meager beginning that it has made. Now, recently, a document from Sweden reached my desk entitled, A Report on a Delphi Study, Information, Documentation, and Media, this study forecasts the outlook for the 70s, 80s, and 90s in Sweden. For the 70s, the study predicts that the capacity of information and documentation libraries will increase and new functions will be added to a limited extent. Printed material will still be the predominant media for dissemination and storage of information. The function of libraries will remain essentially unchanged in the 70s, they say, but the share of libraries of the total amount of information will decrease because of a heavy expansion of other types of information systems. Now the forecast for the 80s, which is eight years off, runs something like this. Several new functions will be developed within the IND systems and the systems will be interconnected to a limited extent. Libraries will undertake the marketing of processed information adapted to the user's needs. And although printed materials will predominate for storage of information, new techniques will make considerable headway. For example, they predict that in the 80s that scientific journals will be replaced by computer-stored material. Only a small part of the total mass of information will be transferred via paper, they believe. By 1990, the study predicts that the IND systems will attain a high degree of specialization and have far-reaching interconnections between information systems. The transfer and storage of information will be largely by electronic means. The average individual will face a greater range of alternatives when consuming information. And I'll quote just one paragraph. Toward the end of this century, the average individual will communicate several times a day with various sources of information by the use of data terminals, 
He will also use the video phone as often as he uses the ordinary telephone today. Further information on civil rights and duties will be communicated to him automatically and selectively, that is, on the basis of stated profiles of interest. The submission of applications and statements of various kinds will be reduced, as will paper-bound communications in general. Far-reaching decentralization of higher education and adjustment to individual needs will become feasible through communication with educational data banks via extensive terminal networks. Proper use of these new facilities for information and communication will require changes in the contents of education on many levels. Now, if these predictions from the Swedish government prove true for the United States as well, then we have only 10 or 15 years to master and manage the technological forces, assuming, of course, that this is the direction society needs and wants to go. Now, there's one advantage of being a near senior citizen, as I am, and that is that one can freely point out the problems 10 to 20 years ahead without having to face up to how we get there from here. And I can only hope that somewhere, perhaps in this audience, is a supermind that can build a bridge. For we must not lose sight of the simple fact that today's graduate will be the, the mid-career senior librarian of the year 2000. Thank you.